Station, 23 minutes before 9 o'clock. We've got 23 minutes to deliver news to you. We take the news from around the world, around the nation, and around the state, and we deliver it to you during this segment, and we shorten it. We deliver it bite-sized. That's why we call the segment News Bites, and you can hear it each weekday morning here on WOCA, The Source. It gives you an opportunity to catch up on the news from around the world without spending all day listening to the radio, the newspaper, or watching TV, or whatever. And remember, we also give you the information during the course of this that will enable you to read more if the abbreviated form that we deliver is um, got you interested, has, has made you interested, whatever the word, to find out more. Go to the, um, the resource that we tell you about, whether it's Reuters or the Associated Press or uh, the New York Times, whoever we get it from will tell you. And in many cases, these stories are found on many different news agencies, but we just want you to know which one we've got it from. And once in a while... The agency itself will slant the story. We're not, we're not naive enough to think they don't. Uh, and so, therefore, if you hear a story and it sounds like it's slanted and it appears that Robin and I are interjecting some of our own opinion into it, uh, we're not. However, if we, if we express an opinion, we sometimes do that. We're human. And, yes. And we don't pretend to be you know, talking heads, although mm-hmm. we are. <laughs> All right, the first story. Actually, you know what? I'm not going to read the the top story, but what I want to read is a story that I referenced earlier because I did reference okay. it, and I don't want to forget to do this. Earlier this morning, I had mentioned that there was a story about possible good news regarding the fight against cancer. And so the story comes from the BBC, and uh, I'm just going to read it. It's a very short story. Uh, so if you want to look it up, you can probably find more online. Uh, this is what it says. Cancer killing sticky balls can destroy tumor cells in the blood and may prevent cancers spreading, early research suggests. The most dangerous and deadly stage of a tumor is when it spreads around the body. Scientists at Cornell University in the United States have designed nanoparticles that stay in the bloodstream and kill migrating cancer cells on contact. They say the impact was dramatic, but there was a lot more work to be done. One of the biggest factors in life expectancy after being diagnosed with cancer is whether the tumor has spread to become a metastatic cancer. Metastatic cancer. That's the whole article. Uh, and they're referring to it as sticky balls, but obviously it's nanoparticles that stick to cancer cells and destroy them. Maybe uh, the way I read it is while they're in transit heading somewhere else in your body. So that, that's the good news. And I, I referenced it earlier, but I was doing it off the top of my head. Now I just read it verbatim. That's a godsend, that story, those sticky balls. This is a story from the Associated Press out of Brevard County, Florida. A man said he is jobless after a flu shot requirement was put into effect at one of Brevard County's largest employers. Health First is the county's first medical company to require all employees to receive flu shots. The employees had until December 15th to get the flu shot or they would lose their jobs. David Stillwagon, a certified personal trainer, lost his job at one of Health First Pro Health and Fitness Centers because of the requirement. He worked at the center for more than six years, but refused to get a flu shot when the company rolled out its new policy. This is a quote from Dave Stillwagon. I don't drink. I don't smoke. I don't take drugs by choice. I also make the choice that you can't force drugs into me. A spokesperson from Health First said more than 98% of roughly 7,500 employees complied with getting the free flu shot. Still, Wagon feels there's not enough research into possible long-term effects of the shot, and the company should also focus on non-medicinal, on non-medicinal ways to avoid getting sick. Good for him. Yeah, I, I agree. Uh, next story is from the Associated Press. The Arctic Blast 
has eased its grip on much of the United States. Winds calmed and the weather warmed up slightly a day after record temperatures, some more than a century old, shattered up and down the eastern seaboard in Atlanta, where it hit a record of six degrees yesterday. Fountains froze over, a 200-foot Ferris wheel shut down, and Southerners had to dig out winter coats, hats, and gloves they almost never have to use. It shouldn't take too long to thaw out, though. In the Midwest and East, where brutal polar air has lingered over the past few days, temperatures were climbing, but still expected to be below freezing. Yesterday, the mercury plunged into the single digits, and teens from at single digits and teens from Boston and New York to Atlanta, Birmingham, Nashville, and Little Rock. The cold turned deadly for some. Authorities reported at least 21 cold-related deaths across the country since Sunday, including seven in Illinois, six in Indiana. At least five people died after collapsing while shoveling snow, while several victims were identified as homeless people who either refused shelter or didn't make it to a warm haven soon enough to save themselves from the bitter temperatures. There is no sense of order in the rest of western Iraqi city of Fallujah, apart from that imposed by al-Qaeda, a spokesman for the Iraqi military said. Iraqi Prime Minister Nouri al-Maliki, a Shiite, said that area tribes and local residents should work to regain control over parts of the Sunni-dominated Anbar province. Iraqi military spokesman General Mohammed al-Askari said Fallujah, one of the largest cities in the province, is in the hands of fighters lawyer to al-Qaeda. Uh, this is a quote. Al-Qaeda is in control of Fallujah and appointed a government there. There is no police and no order there than those of Al-Qaeda, reported by UPI. The next story is from the Bloomberg uh, News Agency. The White House is bristling over former Defense Secretary Robert Gates' new memoir accusing President Barack Obama of showing too little enthusiasm for the U.S. war mission in Afghanistan and sharply criticizing Vice President Joe Biden's foreign policy instincts. In a book set for release next week by the publishing house Knopf, Knopf, uh, Gates writes that Biden is, quote, a man of integrity, but also a political figure who has been wrong on nearly every major foreign policy and national security issue over the past four decades. Gates, who is a Republican, also slammed the National Security Council under Obama's watch. The Republican cited what he called the controlling nature of the White House, writing that Obama's national security team took micromanagement and operational meddling to a new level. New data released by National Nurses United revealed that not only do a handful of hospitals charge patients more than 10 times the actual cost of treatment, but that prices have been steadily increasing for nearly two decades. Skimping on care, patients often pay for it with their health, said Joan Ross, co-president of National Nurses United. 14 hospitals charge more than $1,000 for every $100 of their total costs. The union compiled Medicare cost reports from 4,328 short-term acute care hospitals of the 4,655 that filed mandatory annual cost reports with Medicare. Criteria inc criteria included that the hospital's revenue be greater than zero and that the hospitals have discharged at least 100 patients. The union has analyzed these reports for the past 16 years, and it saw the biggest overall jump between fiscal year 2011 and fiscal year 2012, when hospitals charged 7% more than they had the previous year, reported by ABC News. In this story from the Associated Press, authorities say a smuggling attempt at the U.S.-Mexico border was th thwarted when inspectors found a woman from Thailand inside of a suitcase. Customs and Border Protection agents discovered a 48-year-old woman named Porn Kamoy Mongkosramak while inspecting a Honda SUV entering the United States on December 30th in Nogales, Arizona. Uh, the woman, who was from Bangkok, was hidden under clothing in a large suitcase in the back of the vehicle driven by a 56-year-old man from Phoenix, whose name was not in the report. Customs and Border Protection spokesman Victor Brabble said that the woman was being charged with re-entry after deportation. Authorities did not immediately know if she has a lawyer. 80 retired New York police officers and firefighters were charged yesterday in a massive disability scam in which dozens of suspects falsely claimed to have been traumatized 
by the September 11th attacks to receive benefits that they did not earn. In all, 106 suspects were charged in a scheme that goes back to the late 1980s. The total amount stolen from taxpayers could reach $400 million. Prosecutors said many of the suspects claimed U.S. Social Security disability insurance benefits of $30,000 to $50,000 a year for psychiatric ailments like post-traumatic stress disorder, anxiety, and depression that were so incapacitating they are unable to work or, in some cases, even to leave their homes. This is reported by Reuters. And this is from CBS. J.P. Morgan Chase and company will already be set by other costly legal woes will pay over $2 billion for ignoring obvious warning signs of Bernard Madoff's massive Ponzi scheme, according to a news release issued yesterday. The bank will pay $1.7 billion to settle criminal charges and a $350 million civil penalty for what the Treasury Department called critical and widespread deficiencies in its programs to prevent money laundering and other suspicious activity. George Venizelos Head of the FBI's New York office said the company failed to carry out its legal obligations while Madoff built his massive house of cards. It took until after the arrest of Madoff, one of the worst crooks this office has ever seen for J.P. Morgan to alert authorities to what the world already knew. He said that in a statement, and that according to CBS News. Saudi Arabia's Prince al wadid bin Talal, a billionaire businessman and nephew of Saudi King Abdullah, said the production of shale oil and natural gas in the United States and in other countries, primarily done through fracking, is a real competitive threat to any oil-producing country in the world. He added that Saudi Arabia must address this issue because it is a matter of survival for Saudi Arabia. New shale oil discoveries are threats to any oil producing country in the world, said Prince Al Walid in an interview with The Globe and Mail. It is a pivotal moment for any oil producing company that is not diversified. 92% of Saudi Arabia's annual budget comes from oil. Definitely, definitely it is a worry and a concern, reported by CNS News. And from CBS News, a New Jersey man has sued the National Football League, accusing it of pricing average football fans out of the Super Bowl. Josh Finkelman of New Brunswick says the NFL only made 1% of all tickets available to the public for purchase at face value. He says that means most fans must buy their tickets on the secondary market where they can command thousands of dollars. Finkelman's lawsuit was filed Monday in federal court in Newark, New Jersey. It claims the NFL is violating the New Jersey Consumer Fraud Act. Lawyer Bruce Nagel says the lawsuit is seeking hundreds of millions of dollars in damages. The NFL says it is reviewing the suit. It notes that three quarters of the game's tickets are given to teams, which sell them at face value to fans who win lotteries. The price of cannabis in Colorado has doubled since the state became the first in the United States to legalize the drug for recreational use a week ago. According to one estimate, customers buying cannabis in licensed shops are paying an average of $400 an ounce compared to the $200 an ounce previously charged when the drug was only available to people with medical complaints. The price has been driven up by the 25% recreational sales tax imposed by the state and also because there has not been enough supply to keep up with demand. (laughs) Several of the first shops to open on New Year's Day had to close early because they ran out as long queues formed. Reported by the Telegraph. Wow. There you go. (laughs) <laughs> and, and, and it's a telegraph, so they call them cues instead of lines. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, all right, next story is uh, out of Fox News. From beat cops to cashiers to Governor Nikki Haley, South Carolina's newest gun manufacturer has received an absolute tremendous amount of support since leaving Connecticut for the Palmetto State, according to the firm's CEO. Josh Fiorini, CEO of PTR Industries, formerly of Bristol, Connecticut, told Fox News that the firm's new facility in Anor, South Carolina, remains a week away from production, but 11 local employees began sorting inventory on Monday along with a team of training personnel 
from Connecticut, the manufacturer of military-style rifles announced in April that it intended to leave Bristol following the passage of gun control legislation after the shooting deaths of 26 people, including 20 children at Sandy Hook Elementary in Newtown. And, of course, that story from Fox News. The stars of Here Comes Honey Boo Boo had a big scare. According to Mama June, the mother of Honey Boo Boo, the family was involved in a car crash. TMZ first reported the wreck and claimed that it happened when a truck without its lights on struck the family's vehicle. The website also reported that Sugar Bear now has a contusion on his back. Mama June is suffering from back and neck sprains. Honey Boo Boo herself hit her head on a window and Pumpkin has chest bruises and is now experiencing panic attacks. A representative for the show confirmed these accounts to ABC News. Uh, This is a quote from Mama June. We are definitely really sore today, but our top priority is to celebrate Pumpkin's birthday. She turned 14, and no matter how sore we feel today, we are going to go out and celebrate. Of course, reported by ABC News. Sounds like a children's story. I, yeah, I've never does. seen that TV show, so no. I don't know that one. No, I guess it's pretty popular. Though. All right, from UPI News, Senator, or rather Senate Majority Leader Harry Reid suggested some of the U.S. military retiree pension cuts in last month's budget deal could be restored in a funding measure. Reed made the suggestion during debate before the Senate voted to advance a bill that would extend emergency unemployment insurance for three months. Reed said he opposed Senate Republican leader Mitch McConnell's attempt to offer an amendment that would restore the cuts to the unemployment insurance bill Yesterday, Reed, who is a Democrat from Nevada, said restoring the cuts likely would be addressed in the omnibus spending bill being negotiated by Senator Barbara Mikulski, a Democrat from Maryland, and Representative Hal Rogers, a Republican from Kentucky, who lead the chamber's appropriations committees. Support among Senate members for a new sanctions bill against Iran has doubled since the measure was introduced last month. Fifty senators across party lines now co-sponsor the Nuclear Weapons Free Iran Act of 2013, according to multiple Senate aides who expect support to increase in the coming days. That amounts to half of all Senate members, just one shy of the number required for a bill to pass. Senate Foreign Relations Committee Chairman Robert Menendez introduced the bill just before Christmas with 25 co-sponsors. The move, was an, uh, the move was an affront to the Obama administration, which fears the bill could derail fragile nuclear talks among Iran, the United States, and the world powers, reported by the Jerusalem Post. And the next story is from the Associated Press. He is wanted in his native Kazakhstan, Ukraine, and Russia. He was ordered jailed in Britain, an opposition leader from a country that has been ruled by the same man since 1989, a former banker accused of siphoning off billions, Mukhtar... Abliazov uh, has been jailed since police special forces seized him July 31st in the south of France. And Thursday, a judge is expected to rule on his extradition. Courts in London have frozen his assets and issued more than $4 billion in judgments against Abli Azav, uh, who fled Britain days before he was convicted of contempt of court. The Kazakh is often compared with Mikhail uh, Gord- uh, Kordorkovsky for making his fortune during the wild post-Soviet years and then running afoul of the political leadership when he started using his wealth to bankroll opposition. Natural gas prices surged and demand reached an all-time high yesterday as the coldest weather in decades descended upon much of the United States. Prices for certain natural gas contracts, mainly gas delivered the same day or the next day, saw the biggest increases. Prices for one contract in New York reached $99 per million British thermal units, up from a normal winter price that usually hovers in the high teens or the low 20s. This is record demand, and I'm quite sure nobody saw this coming. This is a statement by Samantha Santa Maria. She's the managing editor of the commodity research firm Platts. Her quote continues, I think a lot of people were caught short, reported by CNN. And this story from the Jerusalem Post, Iranian Parliament Representative Mohammed 
Nabavian said that Iran needs a nuclear bomb because of Israel. He said, quote, we don't aspire to obtain a nuclear bomb, but it is necessary so we can put Israel in its place, unquote. Nabavian said that in a speech given on Friday and quoted by the Middle East Media Research Institute. The Iranian Tasnim News Agency website, which first quoted Nabavian, later removed the comment about Iran needing a nuclear bomb, according to the report. Nabavian Bavian also revealed statements made to the Iranian parliament by President Hassan Rouhani, demonstrating that the United States administration was pressing hard for a meeting with him. He said, quote, after I won the elections, uh, Obama relayed a message to me. Before my September 2013 visit to New York, the White House contacted me five times seeking a meeting. Now the question must be asked, why does this superpower insist on meeting Iran's president while calling us a third world country? And that was a quote from Rouhani. And again, the story comes from the Jerusalem Post. The top Republican on the Senate Energy Committee urged President Barack Obama to end a 39-year ban on exports of U.S. crude oil, joining what is shaping up as a major election year debate over energy policy. This is a quote from Senator Lisa Murkowski of Alaska. She is the top Republican on the Senate Energy and Natural Resources Committee. We need to act before the crude oil export ban causes problems in the United States oil production, which will raise prices and therefore hurt American jobs, reported by Bloomberg. And this from the Associated Press, a Russian research ship at the center of an Antarctic rescue drama has broken free from the heavy pack of ice two weeks after it became trapped. Trapped. Officials confirmed this morning, just hours after a Chinese icebreaker that became trapped while help, trying to help the academic Shokalski uh, uh, also freed itself and was heading for open waters. The academic Shokalaskli had been trapped in ice-clogged Commonwealth Bay since Christmas Eve when the Chinese ship that came to its rescue, Zhu Long or Snow Dragon in Chinese, reported last week it also was stuck. But the Snow Dragon was able to use its helicopter to retrieve 52 scientists, journalists, and tourists from the Russian ship. They are now on their way home aboard the Australian icebreaker called Aurora Australis. The Chinese official Xinhua News Agency reported from the Snow Dragon with 101 crew aboard yesterday that it successfully escaped and after making a 100 degree turn and pushing away the ice and opening up a channel of water. In other words, both ships are out of the ice down in the Antarctic. Oh, thank God. Hundreds of Amtrak passengers were rescued yesterday after spending a bone-chilling cold night stranded on board three Amtrak trains that were crippled by snow and ice outside of Chicago, Illinois. More than 500 passengers who were affected by the delay are expected to arrive in Chicago this afternoon, likely on charter buses nearly 20 hours after they got stuck. Amtrak spokesman Mark Maglieri told ABC News the trains were halted late Monday near Mendota, about 90 miles west of Chicago. The passengers were aboard the Southwest Chief from Los Angeles, the Illinois Zephyr from Quincy, Illinois, and the California Zephyr from the San Francisco Bay Area. The trains ground to a halt at 4.15 p.m. Eastern Time Monday after they hit a 12-foot snowdrift that paralyzed the engines. This is reported by ABC News. That's all the time we have for uh, News Bites this morning. Robin, you are a trooper. I Thank can you. tell from uh, that well, wasn't easy for you with what's going on with you right now. All right, we will uh, move forward. Uh, we do this each weekday morning. We read the news. We abbreviate it before we start to read it so that we have a shorter version to deliver to you. It's called News Bites, if you didn't already know that. And if you are a business person and you would like to advertise your business on WOCA during that segment or any segment of the broadcast day, WOCA is a 24-hour station. Your advertisements will bring business to your business. That's that's our job. Our job is to tell people about you. Talk to a sales executive to find out how easy it is to do that. You can call or you can come by. Our studios are located in the Paddock Mall just outside of the food court. Come in and speak to a sales executive or you may call us at 732-8000 and get the ball rolling so that we can help you help yourself with a more prosperous 2014. Mm -hmm. Robin, how many stories today? 25. Not bad. 25. No, pretty good. All right. We will take a little break and be right back. Thank you, Robin. Thank you, Larry.
Ocala's Information Station, 1370 WOCA. Ocala!